Griffins are cool, and, of all the mythological creatures, perhaps one of the most noble. But were the depictions of them based on a real creature, or were they just misinterpreted fossils? Let's find out in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there, and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult, and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author, and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I am quite surprised that I'm recording this in September. It feels like it was only yesterday that it was March and lockdown had just started. But this is obviously what happens with time. It continues whether you want it to or not. Now, we did finish up Health and Medicine Month last month, and this month we're moving on to Mythological Creatures. I should point out that we're going to be looking at slightly less obvious examples of Mythological Creatures because the way it sort of worked out is I wanted to look at things that were perhaps a little bit less obvious than the stuff that's normally covered. So where we're going to have a look, for example, at dragons next week, I'm going to look at a very, very, very specific sort of subset of dragons, just because otherwise it's a massive topic, and I thought it would be quite good to have a look at the stuff that other people perhaps don't. So you may be wondering, with that kind of introduction, why we're starting with griffins, because griffins are probably one of the better known But it was only as I actually started researching this that I realised there's a lot that we still don't know about griffins. And they are actually interesting in their own right, rather than how they appear in myths. So they've got their own kind of origin story and everything, and a possible origin story, which is quite cool. So that's what we're going to look at in this week's episode, rather than just recounting myths and legends and things like that. Now, most people's first introduction to griffins probably comes via popular culture. Now, mine was because it was the logo for the Midland Bank back in the 80s. And it was it's also part of the Vauxhall car insignia in the UK as well. And they are a very striking example of a mythological beast. And they're far more ferocious than unicorns, but I would argue more approachable than dragons. And typically, griffins are hybrid animals. They are part eagle and part lion. They usually have an eagle's head, four legs and wings, and then a lion's body, hind legs and tail. Obviously, they do vary within that. Sometimes you'll find them where they've got a feathered like front part of the body, but then the back's fur. Other ones only have feathers on the front legs and the wings, and so on and so forth. So it does depend on the depiction. There are also marine versions where they've got a tail like a merman instead of hind legs so there are different variations of them but the general gist of them is eagle plus lion and as eagles are the king of the birds and lions are the king of the animals this then makes the griffin an especially regal creature but strangely for a seemingly popular mythical creature there are very few actual specific myths about griffins and they do seem to be more symbolic than functional and many of the articles that I consulted while I was putting this episode together would say things like they were believed to but then there wasn't any actual stories where they did any of the things that they were believed to do and for creatures believed to have the power of speech there aren't actually any myths that let them speak for themselves. And instead, they appear as decoration or within insignia, much like the examples I gave before for the Midland Bank and Vauxhall cars. And griffins do appear in medieval heraldry as well. But as a symbol, the griffin represents ferocity, strength, speed, intelligence, vision, basically all the things that you would also find associated with eagles and lions, but just slammed together. But where do griffins actually come from and why do they appeal to us so much? Well, some people place the griffin's origin in Ethiopia or India and other stories place the griffin's origins in the Persian Empire and that's particularly the Scythia region and Jackie Craven explains that Scythian nomads took their stories to the Mediterranean where they then told the ancient Greeks their tales of the griffin. There is evidence of them in ancient Egypt as well but I do think that we should really credit Asia as their likely source although they are more common in stories from ancient Greece. So they do appear in frescoes in the Palace of Knossos on Crete and the griffins even flank the throne in the throne room which gives us a very early glimpse into their protective role. Now in early Greek art they either pulled Apollo's chariot or carried him up to his sun chariot so he could then take the sun across the sky giving us daytime. 
And this association with the sun god Apollo does explain their links with solar energy. And you'd often see them associated with colours like yellow or orange. Now, in other depictions, they also pulled the chariot of Nemesis, goddess of retribution, and here they were believed to both act as guardians and dispense justice, and other people saw griffins as the hounds of Zeus. But that said, while there's all these depictions of them in Greek art, the first known written text about griffins only actually appeared in the 7th century BC, and they basically became popular in ancient Greece between 700 BC and 300 AD, but very little was added to their legend after the later date, and that by that point they're essentially codified in this particular way, and then they move on much later, obviously, into medieval art, where they then take on some new symbolism. But where you do find people in certain griffins into myths about gods like Apollo or Zeus, they sort of do so by extrapolating the stories backwards from the art. So the griffins aren't necessarily in the written versions of the myths. They're kind of added later, if that makes sense. Now, Adrienne May and Michael Heaney actually raised the point that griffin mythology differs somewhat from classical Greek myths, because in the Greek legends, heroes battle monsters that are clear hybrids of other species. But then when the griffin appears in Greek art, it doesn't actually interact with any of the heroes in the myths, and instead it's treated like a real animal from a distant land where it interacted with real people. Now, one of the things that does follow them through is this role as a protector or a guardian of some description, and this starts in the legends that see griffins guarding treasure. And people believe that they guarded gold mines in particular, although this association with gold could potentially come from their solar links through Apollo. There is another link, but we will get to that later on. Now, in 77 AD, Pliny the Elder made the claim that griffins actually uncovered gold while making burrows. And a report in 200 AD by Aelian, a Roman compiler, then describes the griffin's ferocity towards humans as not being an instinct to guard gold, but rather being a parental instinct instead. So they're trying to protect their chicks in their nest rather than fighting humans over the gold in their nests. And yet this same report does refer to two different beliefs that griffins wove gold into their nests and that they actively guarded it. So it does just go to show how easily different word of mouth sources can give rise to a wholly new yet completely unfounded belief. But so strong was the link between griffins and gold that in books three of his histories, Herodotus actually explained that the north of Europe boasted the most gold, and a group of one-eyed men known as Aramaspians stole the gold from griffins. Now, the Aramaspi lived in what is now the area of the Ukraine, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan and Russia, and in these stories, they used to use horses to attack griffins, which does explain why in quite a lot of depictions, griffins are attacking or killing horses. Now, according to various sources that I read, on the rare occasions that griffins and horses actually mated, their offspring were called the hippogriff. So in, in these cases, you had the front part of the griffin remain the same, but then the body was that of a horse, not a lion. So is there a realistic explanation for the griffins? And surprisingly, yes, sort of. The theory doesn't explain that griffins were real, but rather how people may have thought that they were. Now, Mare and Heaney point out the link between folklore about monsters or giants in regions that are absolutely rich in fossil discoveries, and you see this a lot in places like China. So, Mare proposed that travellers on the Silk Road saw dinosaur fossils in the Gobi Desert, in particular, the Protoceratops, and they did find this huge, huge area that was just littered with their skeletons, their nests, and the skeletons also of young Protoceratops as well. Now, because they're in like the, the same family as the Triceratops, you'll know what one looks like. It's a bit like the Triceratops, but without horns. So it's got this bird-like beak at the front of the skull. It's obviously got four legs, so it looks like a four-legged animal with a bird-like beak. And many of the fossils were also found near nests, which then helped to give rise to the tales of the griffin. And obviously then these fossils were lying near gold veins, which helps to explain the link between griffins and gold. Now, Mayer comments that the addition of wings to the griffin's design was a little bit of artistic license, based on the fact that these creatures had quite avian characteristics. So you've got the bird beak and then the nests of eggs are two of them. But then Mayer also notices the tendency of some birds to hoard shiny objects, which could go to explain the gold in the nests. So people have essentially taken each of these things individually and then extrapolated backwards and gone, oh, well, this must be what this is. But there are other theories which actually think that the stories gave travellers a way to interpret the fossils because griffin legends do predate the Silk Road. So in this case, 
people are finding the fossils and interpreting them based on the stories that they already know. And given how old a lot of the artwork of Griffins is, that one I kind of feel like is a little bit more possible. But it does then mean that therefore that's how they could interpret these fossils before obviously they knew what dinosaurs were because of the fact they had these legends of Griffins as a starting point. And Griffins then end up in the medieval world because Byzantine artists used Griffins in their mosaics and then these designs spread from the Eastern Roman Empire into the Western Roman Empire and then they essentially spread across the art of Italy, Spain, England and France. And Griffins became really popular figures in tapestries, in paintings, in illuminated manuscripts and sculptures. And you then find many medieval gargoyles are depicting griffins, which is a trend which sees them continue to guard things like cathedrals and even banks. Remember, obviously, a gargoyle is actually functional and they're usually some kind of water spout. I, I love gargoyles. That's completely irrelevant, but I just thought I'd put that in anyway. Now, despite the griffins' reputation for intelligence and courage and wisdom, medieval griffins ended up having something of a character assassination because bestiaries began discussing battles between knights and griffins. So in one fictional travelogue, a knight claims that griffins are large enough to carry an entire knight on horseback to their nest. And a 12th century legend even claimed that Alexander the Great had fought griffins and he could only overcome the beasts when his archers shot them out of the air. And the griffin is then essentially recast as a ferocious, dangerous beast rather than the noble guardian of the Greeks. And Clark Driesen suggests the popularity of griffin images on coats of arms may have been related to families then fighting during the Crusades. Yet others in the medieval period actually took the griffin as a symbol due to its role as a ferocious guardian. And as Adrian Mayer puts it, and I quote, by medieval times, the griffin had become a creature defined by its allegorical attributes, end quote. And at this point, many of the legends basically seem to fall away and they're just replaced by this laundry list of characteristics, which is where you'll then get, oh, the griffin represents this and it symbolises this and it means this. And it's all about what the griffin means to people rather than what its legends or anything like that were. So, and if you compare that to a creature like Pegasus, who's named in some of the Greek myths. That's very, very different from the griffins who have gone from what people believed them to be doing to then, ah, they just represent these things. However, there is one legend that did stick with them and it's this medieval belief that griffins mated for life. And according to this belief, when one griffin died, the other partner would remain alone and wouldn't find another one. And there are some people who think that this is why the church then adopted griffins as a symbol against remarriage after you've been widowed. But there are some people who think that these claims were actually just a modern interpretation and the church might have also accepted the griffin for other reasons. And one of these reasons, it was put forward by Steve D. Evans, and it was about the fact that the griffin combines the elements of air and earth, which means that he also represents Jesus because the air element and the eagle nature represents Jesus' divinity, while the lion bodies and the fact that they're related to the earth represents Jesus' humanity. So there's entirely a reason why the church might have then adopted the griffin based on this, rather than this belief that they mated for life. Now, we can't leave the Middle Ages behind without looking very briefly at griffins and magic. And in the Middle Ages, griffin claws were believed to have therapeutic properties. Now, there is a claw, and I say that in inverted commas, which is associated with St Cuthbert, the 7th century bishop of Lindisfarne. And it's actually a horn from an ibex goat. But according to medieval law, griffins only gave away their claws in exchange for medical help from a holy person. Now, two claws and two griffin's eggs were among an inventory that was actually taken of St Cuthbert's Shrine in Durham Cathedral in 1383. And there's no way of knowing at what point these claws and griffin's eggs were actually donated to the shrine. But they were there nonetheless. So you've got the claws are there because they've apparently got therapeutic properties, but the griffin eggs also apparently held magical powers as well. And Bartholomew Anglicus claimed that the egg could repel poison in his 13th century account. And obviously, because this is always going to happen, but people then passed off ostrich eggs as griffin eggs in medieval European courts. And you do sometimes find this in later cabinets of curiosity that, again, griffin claws and griffin eggs are actually parts from other animals instead. But this idea that obviously eggs could repel poison or that there was therapeutic properties in the claws, all of this then added to this protective aspect of the griffin. 
So bearing this in mind, the fact that I haven't been able to give you a specific myth associated with the griffin, just a whole load of beliefs that have accrued over time, what do we actually make of them? And I actually do think that of all the fabulous creatures and monsters of myth, griffins probably do make the most sense because size-wise they're usually described as being the size of maybe a wolf or a lion, so they're not huge. And scholars have debated whether the legends were actually based on real animals like desert-based mastiff dogs. Other people think there are certain types of eagle or even vultures that could potentially have given some given rise to some of these stories if people misinterpreted what they were saying. Other people think scholars invented the legends to give a backstory to the griffin because it was so popular as an artistic motif, particularly in the Near East and the Persian Empire. But since the medieval era, the griffin has basically passed into legend as nothing more than a popular symbol. And as I said before, griffin gargoyles do guard banks and other buildings, and they appear on coats of arms and brand logos alike. And any folklore that was once associated with them has largely fallen away, replaced by their role as a protector. And this, sadly, this mythological creature has largely become symbolic rather than a host of myths of its own. I still do love griffins and I do still think that they're absolutely brilliant but it it does always strike me as a little bit strange that you do get a lot of stuff around dragons in fantasy fiction in particular but griffins are largely often still kind of left to their own devices as it were and perhaps that's what we should do with them just let them crack on doing whatever it is that griffins actually do. I hope you've enjoyed this week's episode. As I say, it was a strange one to research because I was expecting there to be specific myths and then it's like, oh, there aren't any. But you had this fossil origin story and said, which is still kind of cool. So instead of having mythology, you've got dinosaurs, which, you know, dinosaurs are still brilliant. And incidentally, the Triceratops is one of my favourite dinosaurs. But that's completely irrelevant to what we're talking about right now. Next week, we're going to have a look at a subset of the dragon because, as you can imagine, dragons are a massive topic so I'm going to have a look at a very specific pair really of dragon stories and then we're also going to have a look at the unicorn the week after and I do think that the final week is going to be at least the manticore because somebody on twitter requested that and did point out that it doesn't get a lot of love either and to be honest I often forget about it so we'll maybe looking at perhaps a collection of lesser known mythological creatures at that point but anyway that is enough for this week's show remember on monday i will be posting the second part of the folk of palooza where you can find out which of the folklore stories that we put forward in monday's episode which one won you can find that out on monday and in the meantime i hope you have a marvelous weekend and i will see you soon cheerio Thank you for listening to this week's episode. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you did, feel free to subscribe using whichever podcast app it is that you prefer. If you do use iTunes, if you could leave me a review, that would be fab. Basically, it just means iTunes are more likely to recommend this to other people. And if you're interested in more folklore, please feel free to swing by my blog, which is www.icsedgwick.com. And that's Sedgwick spelled S-E-D-G-W-I-C-K. And you can find all of the links, images and other bits and pieces that hopefully you enjoy. So have an absolutely fab week ahead and I'll see you soon. Cheerio.